I thought this morning it would be useful to uh, bring down the register of the discourse a few notches to understand from the level of ordinary reality, not that that exists, but it, that is the common delusion of the illusionary ego, uh, why it's impossible to have any other kind of revolution than a spiritual revolution. And what exactly is the nature of the impasse that the world is in that makes a spiritual revolution seem impossible? And in fact, it is impossible. It's, it's inevitable, but it is impossible. So uh, we need to confront that. And uh, without grasping, I think, the full parameters of the problem, <laughs> From the ego level, we cannot understand uh, the, the path to the real uh, beyond the ego. We are crucified by the fact that we are torn apart by a double debt drive. And there's a lower debt drive and an upper debt drive. And this is to put into economic terms uh, the idea of the death drive. Death and debt are very closely related. <clears throat> so, lower debt drive, upper. So, let's see if we can understand the difference and how they affect us. <clears throat> so the first thing to understand, I think, is that the capitalist system is not an accident. It, it is a, a perfect reflection of the nature of the ego and of the ego's <clears throat> tendency toward narcissistic withdrawal from the other as a means of solving its inability to relate in, a, in an authentic sense. <clears throat> and so uh, the fiction of money was created in order to enable us to bypass the need to have relationships with one another. <clears throat> because you can usually buy what you want. <clears throat> These days, of course, it's been taken to an even uh, more extreme realm because men don't even have to uh, pay for prostitutes anymore. They don't need an actual woman. You can get a sex bot and, uh, and, and purely uh, relate to an imaginary other that has uh, no ability to talk back except if you program it to say what you want to hear. Uh, but it's usually, uh, I, I doubt that too many people are interested in the verbal level of a relationship with a sex bot. <clears throat> but in any case, I have no idea except from uh, uh, speculation about that. But I imagine that because I see more and more articles about this, and more brothels seem to be opening up uh, in, in many parts of the Western world, and it's simply an extension of the fact that uh, human beings have lost our ability to relate to one another in an ever more extreme way since the invention of the internet, uh, that, uh, that, that it's uh, an inevitability that uh, people would uh, adopt uh, such a, a measure to avoid having to actually make a connection uh, between, uh, uh, between people at a a true level of 
consideration and uh, interest and ability to listen. We are even very rapidly in danger of losing our capacity for language. You know, since we passed out of the, uh, what, what McLuhan used to call the Gutenberg galaxy, uh, we traded in words for images. And, uh, and, and that's mainly what we're influenced by. That's most of the input we get are images on the internet. You don't even read stories. You just get the image and uh, a few uh, uh, key signifiers and you go on. And, and usually the stories aren't worth reading anyway. And even in people's emails, uh, they're no longer really writing uh, actual prose with one another. We're no longer writing and speaking beings. We are emote icon emitting beings. <laughs> and uh, we are gradually losing our capacity, literally, for, uh, for holding a conversation with one another. And so this is creating uh, a more uh, of a desire to abuse money to, uh, to buy what you need and who you need for whatever uh, utilitarian purposes without having to create a true connection. And, and I think that's one of the diseases that we're now uh, dealing with. So the lower debt drive uh, will drive us to go into debt, financial debt, in order to be able to get to the amenities, the jouissance that we want without having to relate to others or create karmic debt. But we're already in karmic debt to, uh, to the social system because it provides the fiction of money that we are accomplices in believing has any value. And uh, the, uh, the ego, because of its stunted emotional growth, because it never goes through a rite of passage to true adulthood, remains in a kind of infinite debt to its parents and to the family and to the social system for providing uh, the, the, the security, the social security web, not that it really exists. In, in all that uh, wonderful form, but uh, people depend on that. And, uh, and they are, because of that dependency, uh, less likely to develop their own internal initiatives. And the debt to the system uh, causes them also then to be indebted to the fantasies of the other. People can no longer even create their own fantasies. They have to go to watch movies in order to get it. They don't read books anymore. At least in the old days, you'd read a novel and you'd have to create the images in your own mind and you, you'd have to, uh, to, to create a virtual reality out of the marks on paper. But now it's all given to you, a prepackaged uh, fantasy created by uh, George Lucas or Spielberg or whoever. But uh, you're no longer even uh, able to fully use your own imagination. It has atrophied because of the dependence on Hollywood and all, on all of the other sources of infotainment. And so the, the lower debt drive has gradually brought us into a, a very fixated and primitive ego level of consciousness in which we are continually battling with images in our own minds of uh, parental voices talking to us and reprimanding us for not doing this or that or for uh, or other kinds of images of lost opportunities or uh, events for which we feel some guilt and owe some debt for and therefore feel bad about. And the mind is constantly throwing these images at us. Uh, if, if you sit and meditate, I'm sure most of you are being forced to witness uh, images coming across your mind, many of which are unpleasant which is why a lot of people prefer to fall asleep in meditation, because who wants to have to be the witness to those kinds of ideations that you can't control that are basically attacking you? So once you fall into the ego level, you become subject to the whole panoply of animalistic drives that go along with the debt drive that put you in further debt uh, to uh, the society which uh, feeds those, uh, those lower drives. 
and there's guilt then for becoming dependent on the other. It's, of course, the usual, the sex drive and uh, the, the money greed drive and the gluttony drive and all of the other addictions and hatreds that are there to mask one's terror of one's own neediness and helplessness in a world in which one really has no control and in which one's money does not have a fixed value and is because of inflation is going down and will soon have no value. So the ego does feel guilt for this uh, fall into its own degradation, but it represses the guilt by rationalizing its behavior as being socially adapted and it's approved of by the family system and the internal demonic superego. We, we have two kinds of superegos. One says, uh, do what I say, not what I do, and the other one says, do what I do. Okay, and so uh, usually people will follow that one because uh, that's the, uh, the, the easiest one to be able to, to follow when you remember the hypocrisy of your parents punishing you for things that they themselves were doing or a lot worse things, then uh, one is easily able to justify that behavior, but that doesn't stop the other superego from then coming back and attacking you for it. So uh, you're, you're sliced in half by these two different kinds of superego voices. Uh, <clears throat> the worst guilt today, I think, uh, unlike in Freud's day, or even you know, back in the 50s, uh, when, uh, when people felt guilt for uh, sexual activity, now I think the real guilt is for food lust. And uh, because you have to, you know, not be overweight and you have to have a certain look, everyone really has to be semi-anorexic. Uh, and so the, the lower debt drive means that we have a desire to overeat, but then in order to compensate, we have to go into a state of ketosis. So there's this whole fad of intermittent fasting these days, which I think is extremely... Uh, uh, significant in representing uh, this double activity of, of your overeat and then you skip a few meals and you've, uh, you know, uh, absolved yourself of the guilt. And as long as you're in ketosis, you feel like, you know, <laughs> you're being smiled upon by uh, the higher powers. Now, in the upper death drive, it's not ketosis, but kenosis that is what the, you want to strive for which is the emptying out uh, of the ego so that one can be filled with God consciousness. But here you just want to make sure that you're not filled with too much um, caloric intake. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what, what, what happens is that even sex has become a secondary uh, kind of uh, jouissance. The, the food lust is the primary way of getting satisfaction and of using your mouth through eating. And only when you really have nothing to eat or you're in the ketosis mode, uh, then uh, you, you are forced to use your mouth for other things. And because people are no longer able to carry on a conversation, what they tend to do instead is to choose to have sex with each other. So uh, sex operates, uh, using the mouth to suck on sexual objects is a kind of use uh, of it uh, for a transitional object because you can't uh, make it all the way into the capacity to have a, a rational relationship based on uh, co concepts and on insights into reality at, at a symbolic level, then uh, those, those lower two aspects are uh, what tend to get acted out. And because everyone these days is, is at least semi-anorexic, uh, most people can't even enjoy a feast with each other uh, too often, and so having sex becomes the, um, the way out of the impasse of not being able to relate. But it otherwise is not an end in itself. It's just a way to keep the mouth busy. So I, I think that it's this, um, this complete loss of the capacity to connect verbally and symbolically with one another that has so impoverished us 
that we, we have lost our uh, ability to get out of the debt that we are in to jouissance because we, we have no other options left within the ego. It's been too impoverished of ideas. People don't have anything to share with each other any longer. Uh, and, and so they, they will tend either just to grope each other or uh, you know, to go to a snack bar. But it's not uh, the, the capacity for relating has, has been dumbed down to such an extent and the, uh, the social system makes it uh, so easy to, to drop out of a relationship rather than to deal with problems that arise in a relationship that, uh, that the fallback position is uh, simply to disappear. And this, of course, creates more of a karmic debt that we, we build up toward one another. The upper uh, debt drive is mostly uh, repressed and we use money to keep it repressed, and we use all of these other activities that have become relatively meaningless in order to forget the fact that we are indebted for our lives to a supreme power that is no longer socially recognized, in fact is ridiculed, those, of, those people who, who believe in the reality of such a power or anything outside of materialism. Uh, are, are generally, at least in terms of the mainstream uh, uh, paradigm, are, uh, are considered to be uh, somewhat wacko. So the, uh, the, the guilt for having uh, gone along with that materialistic mode of being, if one has, or if one has broken away from it in order to have a life more in new age circles, but still is not actually transcending the ego, but using spirituality as a come on and as a gimmick and as a, a way to justify taking drugs and that kind of thing uh, creates more of a, uh, of a kind of a debt to the source that is uh, uh, in a way allowing you to get away with dabbling in and playing with powers uh, that are, are far too powerful to uh, mess around with. And so there is a, uh, uh, a lingering fear that one will take one toke over the line, as it were, uh, one trip too many, and, uh, and one won't be able to come back because uh, one has uh, abused the... Uh, uh, the various altered states of consciousness that are accessible through such means rather than uh, taking the straight gate to uh, the internal realms of luminosity in the, in the way that we're designed to do it, which is through an ascetic uh, letting go of body consciousness and of uh, the animalistic uh, enjoyments. So a spiritual revolutionary then would be one who has shed all of those lower lusts and who is uh, able to speak and think, but has also been able to take consciousness beyond thought to that inconceivable power that transcends uh, the ego mind entirely. And, uh, Along with the disappearance of desire, there's a disappearance of karma and of suffering and of ignorance. So the spiritual revolutionary is one who is, uh, is post-desire and, uh, and even uh, post-thought, but, but one who has attained at least mastery of the symbolic realm and the capacity to, uh, to communicate and to, uh, to compassionately uh, perceive uh, the feeling states in the hearts of others and, and be able to relate to those feelings in an empathic way in which the other can truly feel met and resonated with uh, rather than, than simply uh, projected on. Okay, 
So does that make sense? This, I think that unless we get out of this, uh, this situation of the ego's confinement in a, a very small imaginary register of consciousness, uh, we're not going to be able to, to make the rest of the journey. So the other uh, side of it is that the ego wants to be in denial of how bad the world situation is and wants to believe, oh, we'll muddle through somehow. Uh, Trump will figure something out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, p people want to believe that, uh, you know, that don't worry, there's no rush. Uh, when I retire, I can devote myself to spiritual... Uh, uh, quests, but right now I just want to make more money, you know, that kind of, of an attitude. But it's true that the world is not in a political crisis. We're, we're past the crisis. A crisis is when you realize there's a problem, you, it's a danger and an opportunity, and you, you do what is necessary to resolve the problem. Uh, we didn't. We passed the point of crisis. The world is already the walking dead, okay? Our, our ecosystem at a planetary-wide basis has already lost its capacity for sustainability. The web of life has been cut too badly. And I don't need to go through all of the species that have become extinct in the last few decades. There's literally hundreds of thousands of them. And, and we are losing the bees, uh, we are losing uh, the frogs, and, and we're losing so many species. The birds are dying off. Uh, we're, we're losing too many species to be able to maintain the uh, symbiotic relationships between life forms. That, that require one another. If you don't have bees, you're not gonna have almonds and other kinds of fruits because they won't be fertilized, uh, because there, there, there won't be any uh, beings left to be able to accomplish that. And, and so uh, we are losing uh, the plant kingdom as well as the animal kingdom in, in this loss. And we're destroying uh, the, the soil, the air, the water. Uh, Fukushima alone is putting tons of radiated water into the, into the Pacific that's traveling around and it's already reached the US and of course Asia and other parts of the world and it just keeps circulating. The seas are dying and the sea levels are rising, climate change can't be stopped, the increase of the seismic and volcanic activity is exponentially uh, accelerating. It's, there's no way to control these things. Uh, human uh, powers are dwarfed by the events that are happening at a geophysical level that were created by the malfeasance of the ego, but now that Frankenstein cannot be controlled. And so all of these uh, problems are adding up to a perfect storm of uh, an apocalyptic uh, doom that we are going to have to be able to face and, uh, and to, to confront it successfully will require a much higher level of intelligence and attunement to the nature of what reality really is in order to be able to uh, survive and have a continuity of consciousness through the, the singularity of the omega point that we are rapidly hurtling toward. So nothing is going to be done on a political level. The system is way too corrupt. It, it's too uh, uh, controlled by powers that uh, you don't vote for or have any other influence on, and you don't even know who they are or what planet they come from. And so the situation is uh, of such a nature that there is no adequate way of responding politically to it. And, and as you know, the, the powers that uh, at least are the figureheads of the uh, societies mostly don't have the ability to communicate other than sending out tweets 
uh, and and there again there's no statesmanship there's no diplomacy there are threats and there are bombings, and there are assassinations, and there are those kinds of things, cyber war activity, all of that, but, uh, but no actual uh, fail-safe method of, of people trying to solve international problems. The few that do, uh, I think Putin and maybe Xi in, in, in China, uh, are not uh, being uh, met by anyone in the West capable of, uh, of having a, uh, an intelligent conversation on how to solve these problems, nor is there any will to do so. And so these, uh, these issues of, of a, uh, a collapsing global political situation in which the empire of the West itself is now coming apart because of factional splits within the ruling class, which is what all of that impeachment nonsense uh, is going, uh, happening in the US is about. And, and because we have created, or those powers have created such a dumbed down educational system and created such passivity in the population and, and uh, an interest only in trivial uh, trips to Disneyland and consumer uh, shopping mall, uh, retail therapy raids and that kind of thing, that people no longer have what it takes uh, to create uh, a, a movement of any kind that would would be um, effective. And those that have been attempted, you've seen the, the grassroots uh, efforts like uh, the Arab Spring and the Indignados and the Occupy whatever and uh, the Gilets Jaunes in France and they'd make no dent whatever in, uh, in the system. So once we understand that nothing is possible to be changed at that level, the only hope is of a spiritual revolution. And so it's very important that we, we understand that um, there's no help coming from the phenomenal plane. It's the, it, the only source of power is going to come from an expanded consciousness that becomes multidimensional and can draw from a source of intelligence that can overcome these kinds of problems that from any scientific perspective are already impossible to solve. And the worst thing is that, that the society is not in a static place, but every day it's falling further and further into degradation. Traditional morality has been overcome. The gender roles have been overcome. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the sense of, of ethics itself uh, has been destroyed other than, than one's uh, demand to be uh, loyal to political correctness. Uh, and, and along with this, it has been a corruption in all of the religious institutions. So uh, people have uh, rightly become rather cynical about, uh, about religion and they've generalized that to a cynicism about the object of religious uh, intention, meaning God, and, and that has become also something that is in most uh, levels of society not, uh, uh, not allowed to be expressed. So because we have fallen into a level of masturbatory jouissance with robots and porn and pills of various kinds to try to keep our emotional balance, and yet none of that works, uh, the fragility of the human ego uh, complex uh, has reached a point where everyone is very close to breakdown, even on an ordinary level, a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't take much uh, to cause one to have a meltdown because the stress levels are already so high to begin with. Uh, one person, uh, you know, not smiling at you the way you want can ruin your whole day. Uh, and, and things, of course, are much worse than that. And so the, uh, the, the kinds of stresses and conflicts that people are feeling without any means of resolving the stress and the strain on the physical organism has caused a massive epidemic of suicide. 
and uh, of opioid addiction and of uh, violence and crime. And because of, of the good aspects of religion have been lost, it's now in the hands of fundamentalist fanatics who are very uh, happy to kill for Christ or Allah or whoever, but, uh, but the main objective is killing and terrorism. And so we're living in a world where uh, humans are, have become inhuman uh, to each other and even to themselves uh, and unrecognizable as beings of divine nature and capable of love and generosity and openness and goodness. Uh, we are far too defended and uh, too withdrawn and alienated and cynical to be able even to reveal you know, how much love we actually have in our hearts that we try to save maybe for one or two people in our world. If you have a child, you'll try to give all the, your love to that one so that at least somebody thinks you're a good person. You know? uh, but there's no, there's no ability to live in, in a loving world, a loving community out there. It's, uh, it's gone, it's extinct. And because there are no voices of a broader kind of reason and of intelligence in the, in the social scene, uh, there, there are no more uh, role models of the kind of uh, moral heroism that we used to, uh, to take for granted would, uh, would be present in a, a field of uh, social relations. Uh, there, there is no longer uh, any opportunity for most people even to grow up having uh, such a, an ideal that they can strive for in their own lives. And instead, what, what they're seeing is uh, people selling out and, uh, and going for the easy fix and the easy uh, uh, celebrity uh, that they can achieve through usually things that are very negative or very trivial or just by getting naked in front of a camera or that kind of a thing. And so people's lives have been uh, defiled by, by their own willingness to go along with this kind of a situation. It's made more cynical by the fact that there have been serious attempts at revolution ever since the French Revolution and the Paris Commune, you know, at the end of the 1800s and of course the Bolshevik Revolution, but they've all failed. Uh, and uh, communism was the great hope for many, many people throughout the early part of the 20th century until uh, Stalinism and the, uh, the, the, the hopelessness of the, the international uh, uh, hope for a, a, a unity among the working classes. The proletariat would rise up against the oppressive bourgeoisie and all of that. It never happened because the working classes of different countries did not have a, a sense of unity. People's uh, identifications were with a particular country or religion or, uh, or, or ethnic or, or racial or other kind of uh, uh, a signifier, but not uh, to, uh, to that of an economic class. And the whole idea of communism, of course, uh, was based on uh, a, uh, a belief in equality, and there's no such thing as equality uh, uh, within the, the field of the ego. The ego is about differences and specialness and hierarchy, and it wants to be on top, and the alpha male or the alpha female these days, but it doesn't, uh, equality is not uh, of interest. Uh, to the ego, so you can create a, a system that uh, gives it lip service in the same way that religions of other types give lip service to it, but it's, it's not going to work. And, and we've seen that, and so for many people who were invested in that ideal as the great hope, uh, th that has been uh, destroyed and no alternative vision has arisen that, that has taken hold among uh, the population. And that's why when there are movements today, they don't have leaders because there's no vision that can actually unify people. 
and there's no uh, capacity to get together and have consensus. The ego isn't able to do that. And, and because uh, there's an anti-hierarchical uh, distrust uh, and a, a mode of thinking that says anarchy is the only way out of this, uh, that anarchy, of course, leads to the dissipation of all of the revolutionary energy. Now, when capitalism first began, it began in a sattvic mode. You know, there's the three gunas that are talked about in, uh, in Indian philosophy. The sattvic guna is the very clear, pure, uh, idealistic level, and then the rajasic is the productive uh, activity level, but you're really running away from yourself and spinning your wheels. And then the tamasic level is just inertia, and you're too lazy to do anything. And, uh, the, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, process degrades and uh, collapses. Well, when capitalism began, it began as a very idealistic uh, movement within Protestantism. And there's a famous book by Max Weber called uh, something like Capitalism and the Protestant Ethic. And, and it was about developing your ingenuity your capacity for innovation, for excellence, for efficiency, and, and, uh, and that you would gain uh, heaven through works, not through faith. And so this Calvinist idea uh, was really the, what, what brought uh, the, the capitalist idea to have uh, such a, uh, uh, let's say, a universal uh, interest. It wasn't just about colonialism and and uh, beating up on people who didn't have the same kind of guns as you had. But it, it quickly fell into that kind of a, a modality. But in the beginning, your excellence is what would bring you the money that would then bring you freedom. Okay, that was the idea. Uh, and, uh, and nowadays, because no one's really capable of excellence anymore, uh, the, the way you make money is through offering some form of jouissance or fulfilling someone else's demand or becoming dependent or, or doing some scheme that's unethical, if not criminal. Uh, and so then the money is not used for freedom because you're no longer even capable of that, but simply to uh, act out more perverse desires and... Uh, uh, larger criminal enterprises. And so the, the system has basically uh, uh, now uh, created an anti-social society in which society for the first time in history is destroying culture. It used to be that society was the, uh, the substructure upon which uh, uh, culture is based and then culture of course its gem is religion, and, and people reach that highest uh, state. But uh, that's no longer even a part of the structural intentionality of, uh, of the system. And so what money has done is impoverished us by uh, enabling us to atrophy all of these higher cultural ideals and destroy them. And, and humans have done that very rapidly in the 20th century. So this is, uh, this is the situation in, in a political sense. There's more I could say, but I don't want to bore you with all of this. Uh, Some of these ideas about the debt drive and, and the, the degradation of capitalism, I want to give credit to a, a, a current thinker named Aaron Schuster, who, uh, who actually uh, uh, wrote a paper about the debt drive. But he didn't have the upper debt drive. He only knew about the lower one. And that's the problem, that psychoanalysis, which is kind of the leading uh, model of uh, social criticism and analysis, 
uh, has no uh, upper end to it. It stops at the ego and says anything beyond the ego is a fantasy. And so once you buy into that, then uh, you, you are stuck trying to, uh, to live a life of drudgery and to make do with the, uh, the kinds of uh, traditional values to whatever extent they remain of raising children and uh, hoping that they'll have a better life and all of that kind of thing. But we know that life is getting worse and worse and it's no longer a blessing to bring a child into the world. And all of this was uh, very clearly laid out by the, uh, the great thinkers of the 20th century, and they should get a lot of credit, whether it's Foucault or Lacan or Gilles Deleuze or Baudrillard. The, 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 the understanding of the nature of the horror of our situation has been very clearly laid out by very brilliant uh, minds, but they haven't figured out a way out of the trap. And that's what we, we have to understand now. One of the ways I think we can do it is to recognize that human consciousness is within a number of sheets. Uh, the sheet is called a, a kosha in Sanskrit. And the physical body, the, the, the chemical and physical uh, organism at the level of matter is called the anamaya kosha. Ana means food, so it's the food body uh, or, or sheath. And uh, the, the, that, that body is basically inert uh, on its own. Uh, if, if it is not uh, covered by the other koshas, it's a cadaver. It in itself has no intentionality, although it's made up of trillions of cells, and those cells have their own individual consciousness, but they are not, uh, in any unified sense, uh, a, a whole. They're not an individual. And when the, the higher sheaths uh, depart or dissipate, uh, the, the body decomposes, the cells do not continue uh, to maintain uh, an organism. <clears throat> that organism requires the second one, the prana maya kosha. I'll, I'll just write the first part, prana. Prana is bioelectromagnetic energy. And, and this is the energy that actually gives life to the cells. If you don't have a flow of prana in your body, I don't care how good your diet is or how uh, good the air you breathe, you won't, you won't survive. Uh, and, and this has been known by the traditional Chinese medical practitioners who talk about the meridians. It's not the nervous system. It's, uh, in, in yogic psychology, they call them nadis, or rivers of energy that flow through and feed all of the cells with electric energy, literally, and connect them and enable them to communicate and to cooperate and for the, all of the organs to be synchronized with each other, et cetera, et cetera. The, the pranic flow is extremely important, but for various reasons, the prana can be uh, cut off from different areas of the body and then you'll begin to have symptoms within the organs that are not receiving enough prana. Or in some cases, some will receive too much prana and they'll be accelerated and no longer synchronized with the actions of the body. So what enables the prana flow and what manages it is the mano maya kosha. Mano, mano, let me uh, have this one here. Comes from manas, which means mind. And, uh, and so we could say it's the mental sheath. Now, the mental sheath is actually what we can also refer to as the ego. It's the level of the operating system of the body within the phenomenal plane. But, the, in, in a well-working organism, the manomaya kosha takes its orders from the uh, vijnana maya kosha. 
Vigyana means wisdom. And that's the soul sheath. And so the ego is supposed to be subordinate to and serving the soul and following commands that the soul itself receives from a higher sheath, which is called the Ananda Maya Kosha. Ananda means bliss, but it, it's the bliss of the, the supernal light that uh, comes through it that recharges <clears throat> the whole energy system every night when you're in deep sleep. When you're in deep sleep and, and dreamless sleep, you touch into that light source uh, that is the Atman. And that in turn recharges the batteries of your soul, which then gives your uh, mind ability to think coherently when you wake up in the morning and to be able to meditate without falling asleep and things like that. But if you're not connected, if there isn't a, a, a complete uh, attunement and connectivity between all of these koshas, eventually you're going to have symptoms in the physical body, you're going to have pranic cuts uh, and glitches, and you're going to have uh, disturbance in the mind. Okay, so, and, and the mind will, will also uh, end up being uh, cut off from higher kinds of inspirations, ideas, creativity, the higher intelligence of the Vigyanamaya Kosha. So what has happened, <clears throat> because the society today has uh, basically indoctrinated people to live from the Manomaya Kosha and to cut off uh, the, uh, the Vigyanamaya Kosha, there is a, the mind has become less and less coherent. It doesn't receive the energy from these higher... Uh, koshas, and it becomes kind of a, a kosha nostra. It, it, the mind becomes a kind of a, a mafia <clears throat> that begins to uh, operate as an independent cancerous mechanism within uh, the entirety of the organism. And this mafia that's made up of the ego self images and the superego images and all of the various other fragments of mind that, that become uh, sub-personalities, they're all in conflict with each other, but they all want to get certain kinds of enjoyments out of abusing the Anamaya Kosha. And so that's basically what's going on. And there's an incoherent animal party going on at the Manomaya Kosha level that has usurped your body and is using it for its enjoyment. And therefore, rather than being productive and innovative and, and excellent anymore, we have fallen into a state of dependency and tamasic inertia and, and we would rather invest our time in video games than in uh, uh, writing a great novel or downloading a scientific theorem or, or creating some new world from a higher level of consciousness. And so we are spending and exhausting our resources because we have trivialized our own being because we're not connected to our being higher than the Manomaya Kosha. And as long as there's a cut between that and the higher sheaths and the ultimate source of consciousness at the Atman and Paramatman levels, we, we will not have the energy or the intelligence or the will uh, to be able to escape the uh, situation that we're in. And the exhaustion level of, of our dead batteries, because they're not getting uh, replenished even at night because people don't sleep well anymore and most of the sleep time is taken up with bad dreams uh, and and try, which are actually messages that are trying to get through to you to help you change your life but in fact don't have that effect they simply cause you to want to take more anti-anxiety pills or whatever and not to analyze the dreams but to try to forget about them and so the uh, people wake up not refreshed, not filled with new life energy and new inspirations uh, that they've had in deep sleep, but instead wake up groggy and, and without any new life force. 
And so because of that, we're getting weaker and weaker and uh, we are aging faster and, uh, and our capacity for hope and, and creativity is, uh, is dissipating into non-existence. So basically that's the state of the union <laughs> or disunion. And uh, <clears throat> to sum it up, the postmodern ego structure suffers from two contradictory and yet uh, coefficient uh, traits. It's both infantile in its attitude toward life, way over simplistic and naive, and wanting everything now and being demanding and having temper tantrums if it doesn't get its way. Uh, it, it has a very childish approach to life. And on the other hand, it's totally senile. It's rigid, it's, it, it, it thinks it knows everything, but it doesn't know anything and it just wants to die. It's not, it doesn't really have any life spark left. And so you have this infantile, senile complex going on that has no actual uh, capacity to live in the present. And, and because of that kind of a complex, uh, people have no ability to function anymore. Okay, so uh, to get out of that, we have to get out of the ego. There, there isn't any uh, halfway measures that will do it. But as long as the ego prefers the potency that money gives it, which is a false potency, rather than the potency of consciousness, which is available to us if we would only explore what consciousness is possible to achieve if we would only access it at a higher level than the ego. But that's hard, that takes work, that takes meditation, whereas you can uh, use your money and buy a, an immediate gratification, you don't have to do any of that. So people are choosing that, and, uh, and that of course is uh, bringing money to having less and less uh, value. And so because the ego is split into this infantile senility also, it can't really make any commitments, either to itself, to life, to other people. It, it can't sustain love relationship. It can't make a commitment, usually even to be in a community. It can't make a commitment to a job, a profession, uh, to anything, uh, be, because it never knows how it's going to feel in the next moment, because it's so emotionally unstable and fragmented into these different aspects and that, that are totally contradictory to one another. And so people generally <clears throat> will choose either a life of immediate enjoyment, those who can do it will pick a life of social success or, or some kind of, uh, of minor uh, achievement, whether it's in you know, rock music or it's in you know, being a, a model or uh, or, or a porn star or whatever, but some kind of limited success. And they will tend to have a, a belief in limitation, in scientism, and in materialism, and, and won't be able to think uh, in a larger possible paradigm of what reality really is. And even though people have broken away from their families geographically and psychologically at an external level, people are very tied to the internal family system that they carry with them in, in the form of the superego voices that do not allow them to change. There's an internal resistance and attack upon you if you were to try to make a commitment to a spiritual life, for example, to taking seriously the idea of being a spiritual revolutionary. The, the, the resistance that you would feel internally would uh, usually be overwhelming. And so those who, who can't do that will try to settle for some kind of maybe political or social activism or intellectualism, or, or they will uh, just uh, you know, take a lot of uh, powerful drugs and try to forget the whole thing. But there's no way from within the ego to get out of the ego's stuckness and incoherence. It can't be done from within the ego itself. So there's a catch-22, because although you know you're trapped and you want to want to get out of the trap, you can't actually want to get out of the trap. Mm -hmm.